You know what? In the <laughs> commotion, I got so worked up, I forgot to ask for the chimichurri. Should we pause and ask for chimichurri? I think it's okay. I think the fries are now have reached a point in temperature where even the chimichurri won't bring them oh, yeah. back to their original luster. That was magazine publisher and food writer Stephen Satterfield. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. Every week on the podcast, we feature musicians, bartenders, journalists, and other San Franciscans talking about living, working, and doing their thing here. It's a way to get to know your neighbors. Welcome to episode 33, part one. In this podcast, Stephen talks about getting a job at Nopa Restaurant, his appreciation of that restaurant's philosophy, and how his time there led to his work with students as part of Alice Craven's Heat of the Kitchen program at Ida B. Wells High School. Check back Thursday for part two, where he'll share the story of launching Whetstone Magazine. Here's Stephen. So, yeah, we're on Divisadero right now, which for my time in San Francisco is basically ground zero. I lived in this neighborhood and worked in this neighborhood for the majority of my time here. So from 2010 uh, to 2015, um, before I moved to the East Bay, but five very full and active years um, within a four block radius of where we are, uh, my home and uh, my place of employment, Nopa Restaurant. So um, the story with Nopa and the community, I guess, is that uh, it's Nopa is sort of, a, I guess, on the verge of becoming an institutional restaurant in San Francisco for people who love eating and gathering. Um, there have been many other restaurants that have opened uh, since Nopa did, probably 12 or 13, or I don't even know how many years ago, but over a decade. Yeah. Um, so they're definitely not like the newest restaurant in town anymore, but an enduring restaurant uh, that still has managed to maintain high levels, um, high standards and service and in the execution of the food. And um, the part that I was most drawn to was just the, the community ethos, the vibe of uh, the restaurant. And that was not really well known, um, you know, my first visit there as a, as a diner. But um, I had a really kind of more conventional experience there where I, I had dinner and I was like really moved by the scale of the restaurant you know it's a huge place and yet they had managed to um like i said keep really high standards around the the bar and the wine list and the all the food that was coming out of the kitchen so i went back uh the next week and was just kind of like hey this is a really impressive operation um maybe you guys will hire me to to like be a busboy here did they do the whole table for one and you're like no 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 I'm just uh, here to well talk. I came in during the day okay um, which is a which is a pro move okay. I mean people don't exactly apply for jobs in restaurants anymore it's sort of a problem but um, if you are going to apply for a job at a restaurant you're certainly improving your chances if you do so during the day right. um, once the doors are open people get really cranky about uh, folks who are coming in looking for employment once it's like a secret handshake you know right. you've just outed yourself like you don't know the secret handshake right. um so don't do that <laughs> but uh so i went during the day and i ended up meeting the sommelier who i had uh met as a diner mm -hmm. sent to my resume and um after looking over it we shared it with the owners of nopa uh and they said we want to meet you for an interview um after interviewing with them, I learned a lot more about their kind of social mission, which is really centered on supporting uh, local farms and our local food community here in the Bay Area. And I was strongly aligned with that mission. I had already had a pretty long career of working in restaurants um, in Portland and in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I... Uh, so you were already kind of uh, drawn to the place just from the dining experience. Yeah, like and I then you learn more and you're like totally. Yeah, I had you guys. You know, I think a lot of people it's who work in restaurants. Um, when we dine out, you know, there's we notice everything, and it's actually really annoying for people who don't work in restaurants because of people who do are like, oh my god, this little thing, that little thing. <laughs> yeah. But I I was noticing stuff that um, instead of you know with a critical eye. Um, I guess in a more negative fashion, I had a critical eye towards like all the things that were going right there and just kind of how, how good everything was. Right. Um, 
And so I thought that they might, you know, the normal uh, way of working in restaurants is that you kind of work your way up, you prove yourself. Um, there's this whole like democratic hierarchy. And uh, so I thought I was going to be a part of that, you know, tried and true system. And I tried to go start off at the bottom. And they said, actually, we only want to hire you if you'll manage the restaurant. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 I don't. <laughs> I've already done that. It's really um, You're like I've got my own latex gloves and everything, guys. I'm yeah. ready. No, it was like I had worked in restaurants long enough to know that it's a really hard job to manage, especially a restaurant on that scale. You know? Yeah. Um, how many? Uh, like, how big is it? Well, in restaurant terms, I mean, during the week, we were doing 500 diners a night, um, and on the weekend when we had brunch, that number could be closer to 800. And, you know, it's 110 seats in the place. Like most restaurants in San Francisco um, would be like thrilled if more than 100 people walked in the door on a given night. So um, just a square footage, ba- like base yeah, just like level. How do you even I mean, yeah, you, it assumes that you even have the capacity, the square right. footage right. to do that. Anyway, um, I declined the job. And then uh, after talking to some of my friends who worked in the industry here, they urged me to reconsider that decision. And I'm so glad they did. And really where we found the alignment um, between myself and the owners Mm -hmm. was with their their civic commitment. Um, And so I decided to come on as a manager and um, just as advertised, they gave me lots of opportunities to uh, participate in the community. There was already sort of some existing relationships um, and space for me to forge, you know, more uh, terrain and create more r- new relationships. Um, so the Ida B. Wells, Ida B. Wells is the high school um, that is a block east of Nopa. So it's right up the hill on uh, Hay Street. Um, if you're at the top of Alamo Square looking at the famous Victorian houses, the Painted Ladies, um, if you look to your right, you will see uh, a beautiful high school on a hill which is the oldest high school in San Francisco, and that school is Ida B. Wells High School. Also, it, if you're doing beta breakers for any reason. Uh, right, of course. Which maybe if is... It still happens like what, right right about the time you're starting to feel buzzed. Yeah. I that think big building on the left is Ida B. Wells. You know what? Maybe that's a... Especially for a San Francisco-centric podcast. We got to cast a, a wide net here. I think we hit a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that... You know, I've always been kind of taken by that high school as um, a pretty low barrier to entry for civic engagement the Mm -hmm. student population there um is mainly black and brown students um who are just there to get their ged so it's not a conventional high school it's uh a bit of a last resort high school for for um, the students who are there so you know you're talking about a population that's probably age 15 to 19 um with a whole host of uh, complicated situations, you know, uh, coming from their home life. Mm-hmm. And so for a while, um, for a couple decades, I think actually the, there's a school guard in there that was being managed by another community nonprofit. Um, and it sort of went dilapidated for a bit. And then in 2011, um, there is a new teacher there, uh, named Alice Cravens who started a culinary, uh, sort of workforce development program for the students there that was really powerful because they also have a commercial kitchen there it's one of the few high schools in the city that had both the garden and a commercial kitchen okay and so there is this really uh clear and tangible opportunity to sort of join the the uh two components of growing food and cooking food um, and it felt like NOPA was really well positioned to, to help support that effort. So um, we organized a couple garden days. We cleared out the garden, all the weeds that had been overgrown. We got a bunch of tools and dirt and made it an interactive thing for um, both the students and the school, but also our our workforce too, our, our staff. Oh, nice. Um, How long had it been lying that's fallow. a very good question. I was trying to think. I think probably can gardens it was be like, fallow? It's, let's just call it fallow. Well, yeah. I mean, it had been a couple of years. I yeah. want to say maybe it was like between maybe three to five years. There was work. So yeah, there was a lot of done. work to be done. Yeah, um, it was in pretty bad shape. Yeah. And um, 
it you know it was one of those things where there was a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning and we actually needed all hands on deck at the beginning but just the progression of it over time um i wanted to make sure that the relationship between us and the school stayed intact so i just kind of stayed on as a self-appointed garden manager i was living in the neighborhood i was working in the neighborhood um, so i took it upon myself to stay involved with that project uh, and I mean, in some ways, at least with my relationship with Alice, I'm still tangentially supporting the, the growth of their program, although now it's pretty well integrated into the curriculum. Oh, nice. Um, so it doesn't require the same kind of management or oversight right. on, you know, on a community level. Right. Um, and now the, the program, Heat of the Kitchen, is looking at other ways that they can actually expand their footprint um, in the city of San Francisco. I think the program, or I guess my relationship to it now, is really more about a personal relationship that I have with Alice okay. Cravens, who runs the program. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that they're working on some really interesting ways to think a lot larger outside of uh, what their impact can be with just the number of students who are enrolled on a quarterly basis mm -hmm. and to um, how they can summon the the city of San Francisco and the restaurant community of San Francisco around some larger ideas about developing a workforce, especially for a uh, disenfranchised um, population of, of young people. So, um, I mean, without going into too much detail about what they're working on, I can just say that uh, there is an organic and exciting evolution around the project that Alice is working on. Awesome. Um, which I'm supporting her work, but it's more in a tangential supportive uh, advisory role there's always a super tangible way for people to be involved in the project mm -hmm. and you can always contact uh, Alice at uh, Ida B Wells High School and say I want to volunteer in the in the garden you know there's always an opportunity to pull weeds you know to replant um, there's always stuff to be done in the garden mm -hmm. and that was really what I found so appealing is that it's highly therapeutic mm -hmm. like any state that you enter the garden with you will always exit in a more relaxed state like it's you can't help it yep and um i think in terms of that therapy and the need that so many of us have especially in san francisco um in urban places where we feel so detached from our community um and Plant, from nature. And from nature, exactly. Um, so playing in the dirt is a really uh, powerful way to reconnect and um, a sense of pride. Like when you go by a school or, you know, you go by a community space, you know, you can't help but tell your friends or whoever you're with, like, hey, you know, I was I planted this kale or whatever in this mm -hmm. garden. And it just makes you feel a lot more grounded, I think. Yeah. Um, and so those opportunities, both at Ida B. Wells, um, but I think probably at community gardens all over the city are, are widely available to us. We recorded this episode at 4505 Barbecue in May 2018. Music for the podcast is by Otis McDonald, a.k.a. Joe Bigail. Film photography for this episode is by Michelle Kilfeather. Story San Francisco is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please follow us there and share the episodes you like. Michelle's photos of storytellers are up on the website, which is storiedsf.com. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review the show. You can email us at storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you Thursday for part two from Stephen Satterfield. Mm -hmm.